This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsiloed. Uh, this is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with uh, Stefan Durkan, who is a um, professor at Oxford um, and studies African economies. He's also someone who's worked with the UK's uh, Department for International Development. So you have both an academic hat and a government hat. And um, you mentioned, uh, Stefan, uh, that it was about a decade ago before you wrote this book, Gambling on Development, that you had to kind of kind of rethink everything you'd been doing in both of these domains. Um, it seems like development economics is, um, on the one hand, a, a distinct field of its own with its own methodologies, its own interests, and a distinct group of people who study it. But, but on the other hand, I mean, I think from an outsider's perspective, people would wonder, well, you know, why should there be kind of economics for developing countries and economics for for developed countries, right? Shouldn't there just be sort of, you know, economics of, of, of growth or economics of, of, of good government? And I think in this book, you, you, you walk through kind of a taxonomy of different kind of approaches to development economics. And, and I think that by the end of the book, you've kind of realized that there's a little bit of wisdom in, in, in all of them, but that there's no, you know, silver bullet. And, and it seems like policymakers, you know, they, they want, uh, a, a silver bullet. And, you know, you described this one scene where you were meeting with uh, a minister in the UK government uh, who was new to the world of development. And you said, well, here, here's, here's a pile of books. <laughs> you know, here's, here's like 20 books for you to read. And, and of course, I think her response was like, look, you read them. So, you know, you tell me <laughs> what, what's in them. So, so, um, you know, is development economics a, a, a domain that, I mean, have we have we really learned anything? Like, where are we in the world of development economics? Do you think that the kind of insight that you've come to over the course of your career is is something that kind of everyone in the field is is starting to come to, or or are there still kind of I don't know salespeople of silver bullets out there <laughs> that we have to kind of warn politicians against? Um. So, so I do think that there's still a lot of snake oil, oil being sold everywhere. There is still a lot of these, you know, people that have magic beans in their pocket and they want to show it. But maybe that always was the case. And I think at the same time, you know, when you refer to what's been happening to um, development economics, do we need a separate one? Um, and I just want to pick that for a moment, pick up that for a moment, because the... You know, I like to think of it, I'm an economist that studies development problems. So I'm not, I don't think there's a distinct methodology to do this, but you kind of systematically try to apply the insights from economics and want to be broad-minded and maybe increasingly study it also from politics and other things to apply to this question that is now so far removed from anyone living in the US or, or in Britain, you know, that early takeoff, these beginning and these early, early moments. And I bet when, you know, the UK started to grow faster, um, you know, I think I was looking at it recently that countries like low income countries now, they're probably at a level of development and Britain was in the 1750s or something, you know, I better wear snake oil salespeople there as well, you know, people that went around with the bullets, the silver bullets as well. And it's, and I find it very shocking that they're still there. And, but you touched upon it already that politicians love them, you know, give me an answer, you know, don't tell me that it's difficult. No, I need to have an answer today. I'm going to do it quickly. And, and, um, and, and especially a technology solution, you know, some like a little, uh, whether it's um, whether it's a small machine or these days an algorithm, and suddenly it will all solve it everything. It is so popular in a policy circle because you know you you you, you want simplicity because you you need to communicate simplicity then to people that need to either vote you or support you or keep you in power, and so doing it. So yeah. So we, we, we're still there. We need to avoid that. I really think it's harmful that we do that. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to name names, but there's some well, well-known American professors in certain universities who still occasionally go around and seem to be showing these magic beans and try to mm -hmm. sow them here and there. And, 
yeah, I, I'm I'm not a big fan of of that kind of way of, of advising policymakers. Well, I mean, it seems like there's two consumers of uh, of magic beans, right? There are the uh, folks who are actually running in the political circles of these developing countries, right? But then there's also the the folks on the outside, right? The folks who are um, providing uh, foreign aid, financial aid, right? People in the development uh, world, right? Or in, you know, governments. And, um, you know, are, are the people on the ground kind of, you know, wiser to this? Or, I mean, are they more kind of realists? You, you mentioned there was this wonderful story where you were – um, in the presence of all these ministers, I think it was in, in the DRC, where they presented this wonderful PowerPoint presentation <laughs> detailing all of the the things that they needed to do and so forth. And, and it, would, it was almost like designed perfectly for a, an audience of IMF specialists. But, but you knew, and, and they knew, and probably everybody in the world knew, everybody in the room knew that this was just kind of a, some kind of theater, right? I mean, do, do, the, do, do the people, I mean... Do the policymakers on the ground in these developing countries do do they kind of see the 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 reality uh, in in a more objective way? Are they kind of capable of seeing the context, or are they also kind of susceptible to um, you know buying these these magic solutions? So, I think I've met various types. And, and maybe in some sense it's, it gets to the core of of the book that, you know, I do believe and I definitely have met and I definitely know of countries where those people that have power and influence in their places, um, you know, it could be politicians, could be people in military all the way to, you know, journalists, public, public, public intellectuals and so on, actually kind of really want to make progress. And those who want to make progress, they are much wiser about their own situation because, you know, they know what the reality is. If you want to be effective in policymaking, in actions, you know, you can't do too many things at the same time. You need to think very carefully about your priorities. You need to uh, you need to be willing to learn what you do and you need to correct and you, you do so. And if you then go to these kind of places, and I name in the book, you know, quite diverse things. It's not just about China, but it's can be places like Bangladesh, it can be places like Indonesia, it can be places like Ghana, where, you know, they are much wiser to that situation. And they also know how to deal with the magic bean sellers. And they know that the magic bean sellers need to come there and they will ask ask themselves, hmm, should I use a little bit of them? Because that's maybe one useful thing to do and, and, um, and doing it. And they, in contrast, you have the other places where they couldn't really care less. Those with power don't really care, care at all about trying to grow the economy, not let alone to reduce poverty and doing things. Well, they love the magic bean salespeople because they come usually with a bit of money. They come a bit of publicity, grand occasions of signing ceremonies, bad massive things to do. And in fact, and I think it's a bit in the book also that I really go against because it's so tempting for the people in development mm-hmm. to then embrace these people and say, oh, they want to change because they want my magic bean. You know, they agree with me that the technology here, that little thing, it's going to save it. Most of the time, it's these places where nothing will work. I had a really great experience in Ethiopia at some point. You know, there was a time now there's conflict and so on, but there was a time, you know, definitely a 15, 20 year period where they're very committed to development. And I remember that because of some political reasons in the UK, we were more or less instructed to, um, as the aid agency, we should have more programs that involve property rights stuff. Because, you know, that's how we think we developed. So everybody should have very quickly rolled out property rights. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with property rights, but is that the next thing you're going to do and suddenly unlocks it all? So anyway, we're in Ethiopia and there was a program. And actually, interestingly, we knew they were getting interested in giving more land security to the small farmers. And there's some good reasons why this could work. And I was on behalf of the government, of the UK government, had to kind of offer, you know, would you be willing to do this? There is an interest here. Maybe that's of interest to you. And they said, look, we'll get back to you. And and I said, but you, you think they will want to do it? No, we're very interested in it. 
But if we really want to do it, we're going to do it with our own money because then we actually know that it will work in the way that we want to do it. But if we're not that interested, you can give us the money and we'll do it. And I thought, okay, that's a smart government. That's the one I like. They know their priorities mm -hmm. and the aid community can do a bit on the, on, on the, on the side. Well, maybe we can review kind of what have we learned, right? So I remember when I was in graduate school, um, you know, I did a lot of research around uh, the kind of theory of the big push, right? So that was that was the idea in the 50s and 60s was that, you know, if you just gave a whole bunch of money to these countries, right, then they would could escape this low level equilibrium trap, right? It was really about, you know, resources. Poor people were poor because they, they were poor, right? And, you know, you didn't have any money to invest. So if you give them some money to invest and... You know, we, 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 we didn't get great results. I mean, there, some countries did really well, like the Asian Tigers. Others actually even regressed, like a lot of the countries in, in, in Africa. Um, and so, you know, the big push idea was was kind of abandoned or, or transformed. But, but there were still at least some people who were saying, hey, you know, we, we just need to kind of get people out of poverty uh, as the first and most important thing. And, and you know, at least with respect to getting people out of poverty, it seems like we've, we've done an awful, you know, there's been a ton of progress. And I think most people don't really appreciate, and you describe in the book, how much progress there's been in, in just the last 30 years. So on the one hand, like what, what have we, what have we learned? Why have we seen such a huge kind of movement out of poverty? Did, did this movement result in any way from, you know, insights that we, we, we developed in the world of development economics? So, um, so, so I can yes, and there's actually, you know, th there has definitely been learning. So it's 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 you, you're absolutely correct describing, and you know, I was taught like that as well, and you know, and and one of these. So there is nothing wrong with the idea of the big push because probably the old theories were all about complementarities. They needed lots of things needed to happen at the same time. And so you translate in the big push. It was just that laziness that you're not translating it. As long as you throw a lot of money at it, all these things that need to come together suddenly are going to come about because that's the only thing you thought, well, that's the outsider has it and we'll give them a lot of money. And as you correctly say, um, many of these things didn't work. And actually in the way to think about it is that, you know, you need to know, what are the things you need to push? You know, you need to get a sense, and, and I kind of argue, and I think I've, we, we definitely have learned, it depends a lot of where you are, what exactly, what are the levers that you can start using? So there's probably multiple things that need to happen, but it, it will be specific locally, um, and we have to be quite pragmatic about it. Right? So I write in the book also a bit about it. Look, in the end, what have we learned about what do we need for growth you know, the, the common lessons across the countries in terms of the pure policies, they're actually quite vague, you know, some sensible things, you know, be reasonably open, let the markets reasonably work well, government should probably do something on infrastructure, uh, get your macroeconomics sorted. But, you know, you don't need 30 or 50 or 60 years of development economics to come and tell you that. Because, and but interestingly, what you imply you need to be quite pragmatic because you need to find the right combination of all these things, what you prioritize. If we go back in the 1970s, when, as you correctly said, quite a lot of things went wrong. And I'm, I'm thinking here, like, for example, of Julius Nyerere. OK, so this is a guy in Tanzania. Um, and actually, he was a quite an enlightened leader. He definitely wanted to do development. You know, they, you know he, he, he was committed to do it. But he got trapped in the in, in ideology around it. You know, all the thinking was so embedded around ideology then that he actually ended up thinking, well, it has to be African socialism. It has to be in this way. It has to be ideology driven. They got a lot of money from the, from the Nordic countries, the Swedes and so on. Massive amounts of aid in current amounts of money. There's actually unseen amounts of aid that Tanzania got. But actually, they were not pragmatic. They were ideological. Well-meaning, but ideological. So I think what we've learned, definitely in the last 20, 30 years in the policy space, it doesn't help to be very ideological. You need to be pragmatic what you do in your own country. Do common sense. And there's certain things, you know, we know more in economics about the things we shouldn't be doing than actually the things we should do. OK, so we, we know that we, you know, in, in, in a particular moment in time, massive tax cuts is probably not a good idea. In other moments, well, maybe it's okay. We don't really know. And so it's a bit like that. So sensible macro policies and so on. And I think that's definitely a big part that we've learned. And 
The same we've learned that we can't ignore certain sectors. So we've learned, you know, you can't totally ignore social sectors. You clearly need to do spending in health and education. We've probably also learned if you just only spend in education, that doesn't create any jobs necessarily and so on. So I think we've learned things, but um, not necessarily in this kind of narrow academic perfection type of sense. You know, that's academic research. You know, we go for the perfection, the perfect answer to something, but more kind of what is a body of common sense ways of approaching it. And then like in the book I write about it, but you just need a sensible government, someone who's committed to actually do something with it to then apply it. And I think for a lot of the very poor countries, like in Malawi, I feel, you know, I'm, I'm quite embarrassed for a Malawi at times, because I think, you know, it shouldn't be so hard to add a couple of percentage, percentages um, to, uh, to, to growth rates, you know, percentage points to growth rates. You won't be Singapore when you're stuck in the middle of Africa, landlocked with not very rich countries around you. But you can do better. And I think that's what we learned that actually some sensible things to do to do a bit better. And this is actually, I think, behind that it's not just the extreme cases like a China with an incredibly driven way of getting to very high growth, but that actually, you know, forgive me to say it a bit like, but India in, for a while muddled along a bit, but actually mm -hmm. in its own model, and it's a very complicated, quite dysfunctional place, gets to 6 7% of growth rates because, you know, it's... India had that potential for a long time, and when it got, once it gave get, got rid of a bit of pure ideology in the 1990s for economic policy, it's not so hard to actually start growing. Now, it may not get to 10 12%, but it's not so hard for an India to unleash some of its potential. So we, we don't have sort of a, um, a, an established playbook, really. I mean, you know, in, when there's a lot of similarities between kind of history and development. So I, I studied history primarily because I was interested in development. So I was trying to figure out, okay, well, you know, w what comes first, right? So there was all this debate. Uh, okay, you got to have the financial revolution before you can have the industrial revolution. Well, then you got to have the agricultural revolution before you can have, uh, you got to have some property rights, you know, reforms before. So, you know, if, if we kind of encourage people to build the roof before they built the foundation, that's just going to be money down the drain. So, you know, we know if we're building a building, we got to start with the, you know, foundation and then you got to do the walls like do we have a, a playbook that people can agree on that you know you have to start somewhere you know do we start with hey let's you know get rid of infectious diseases and then we can start talking about you know education or you know is, is there any consensus around kind of a step-by-step -step, if you were to design a manual you've got this new enlightened ruler of malawi just just kind of wheeled into office uh, and says, okay, give me, give me, give me the, give me the playbook, right? And I, th I think, I mean, a lot of development economics sort of just starts with the assumption that that person has the capacity to actually execute on, you know, the the, the playbook. Um, when in fact, the, there needs to be like a pre playbook that pr gives them the the tools that will enable them to have the capacity to do any of those things, right? Yeah, no, no, and that and that's actually a really good point, you know, and and. Think, think of historians and, and or, or, or think of it economists, the development economists inspired by history. We got this entire field of institutional economics. Um, and of course, you know, if you take a book like Why Nations Fail, uh, uh, Darren Asimoglu and, and, and James Robinson, you, you, you get a bit of an impression there when you start reading it, is that, oh, well, it's very clear, you know, you, 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 Keep on just building these foundations. That's 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 the thing you need to do. There's no way to build anything on top of it. Uh, well, ultimately, I think the first the first the first uh, the first instruction would be you know get the right history. <laughs> you know, make sure you're exactly starting right. in the right place. That's, that's the one that I kind of uh, also use in the, in the book. Is kind of it's a really frustrating bit. Is that you know you you because you end up telling countries you know don't worry about anything here and now. You just build build yourself a good history now in building institutions. And of course, people don't have times. And actually, the house analogy, I've never thought of it, but it's actually quite an interesting one, because you're not going to first spend all your time building good foundations, because then you're totally wet and you, you don't sleep any night. You probably build something that's not quite perfect, but you actually make sure that it has a roof that doesn't fall off entirely. So now after a bit, if you then put in some things, so you have a very weak floor, but you put a few more things in, you need to strengthen that floor as well. So, so you... So and, and I'm a strong believer, the more I, I worked on development in this kind of 
there is agency here and now to already do something. You know, you can't wait until perfection in anything. So, so you're not yeah. going to errat- get all the education sorted and then doing it. And so people in development like to often think very much um, a bit like, you know, the actually it, it came out of, of, of Marxist thinking, this kind of waves, you know, you need to do it on the first wave and on the second wave and on the third wave or whatever, or some Rostov type of thing, you know, that you had to kind of think. And clearly that's not the way it is. And in fact, the last 30 years prove that that's not the way it's, it's going. There's countries that become opportunistic. They're not perfect. They have, you know, call it smelly state or messy states. You know, they're smelly in the sense that actually lots of things that you really shouldn't approve of. And uh, there's corruption. You know, it's not that I'm in favor of it, but but you can grow with corruption. And that's very clear. You can do this. You know, you need to just be sensible about that it doesn't, that it's not a kind of corruption that kills off the growth. So you, 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 you find a way of actually maneuvering within all your politics and the people that have power who you need to pay off that actually with not perfect institutions, you can do something. So in the book, I talk about Bangladesh, you know, it's like it is the prime example for me of this place where, you know, uh, eights of Henry Kissinger wrote it off as a basket case somewhere around 1980. So it's kind of a famous thing. And the Bangladeshis are so still so cross about it that he said so, you know, you're a basket <laughs> case. And, and, um, and I remember actually my very first essay in development economics was I was given that title, you know, Bangladesh is a basket case, discuss. And of course, I totally agreed, you know, there's a country full of conflict, terrible politics, corruption, droughts, famine, anything you had, it all happened there. But somehow, and only in the 1980s, they actually started, despite all this and the dysfunctionality of the state, or at least the not perfection in any sense, the institutions, you know, they, they allowed the, the garment sector to be built up and, and they didn't capture the rents from the garment sector. They allowed NGOs to emerge, like BRAC, the largest NGO in the world, to actually be really active in social sectors and poverty alleviation. You know, few countries would allow Grameen or BRAC ever to become as powerful. Well, they did so. They let them space. And and that's a little bit like, you know, yeah, we're not perfect, but we need to things all. We'll, we'll find a way of getting it. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, so that's that's the kind of thing, you know, build that first that hut that more or less stays, that keep on improving it. I think that's the way more to think of development rather than focus on the roof or focus on the wall or focus on the foundation only. We don't have the time. The countries don't have the time. Well, I think the heart of your book is really about this thing that you call the, the development bargain, right? And of course, I think it's it's very pragmatic. It makes perfect sense, I think, to folks who have a political science background or even people who are kind of schooled in, in kind of the, you know, Kosian approach to economics, which is, look, you know, if people who have the capacity to make the country rich have no interest in making the country rich, it's it's never going to happen, right? I mean, it, 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 the people who have the capacity to make it happen need to be uh, capable of participating in that, you know, increase in, in, in wealth, right? So, you know, they have to benefit. And what, 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 what I've always seen, I've sort of, you, you use the analogy of Warren Buffett, right? And you talk about if you're an outsider and you're going to provide aid to these countries, you have to kind of take a Warren Buffett approach, which is sort of a, um, you know, value-based approach. But, but I think it's actually more of like a venture capital approach, right? Because in, in venture capital, you know, we always talk about how, you know, a successful venture capital ecosystem or a successful innovation ecosystem is one where, you know, everybody who participates in the growth of a new enterprise benefits from the growth of that new enterprise, right? So the employees benefit and the investors benefit and the founders benefit and the suppliers benefit, you know, and the customers benefit and everybody benefits. And if, if there's anybody who has the cap- capacity to kill that project and they're not in on it, you know, they're going to kill it. And so I think, you know, it's structuring these deals. So, so how, you know, why, how did these, how do these deals work? Like, why is it that say in Ethiopia, a deal was able to be struck yeah. between the folks who have the ability to kill growth and um, the folks who, you know, are on the ground. How did this deal take place and why, why, I mean, if you were going to predict which countries would have the preconditions for these kinds of deals, w- would you be able to do so? Yeah. And so, so the second question is of course the hardest and, and it's, the, it's a real, real, real challenge, but I'll come to that. But on the, the first part, you know, how the deals are struck, 
So, so it's again very striking when you look around the country. So first of all, you know, there was no signing ceremony on TV. Okay, that this is not. This is all implicit. You know, this is not something that's uh, being televised uh, live, and and suddenly the deal is there. So we're talking about implicit deals, uh, implicit contracts that 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 seem to be emerging. So when you look around in the different places, so so I find China first interesting. Okay, so in a sense they did around 1979. You know, whatever we think of China, they did something quite remarkable in the 19, 1979. Is actually to some extent a battle within the party, coming out of a lot of instability. Uh, Cultural Revolution, Mao's death, the Gang of Four, the, the leadership struggles and so on, that you actually got suddenly saying, well, rather than having all the economic policy based on ideology, we're actually going to become pragmatic. Yeah? You know, it doesn't matter whether the cat is white or, or black as long as it catches mice. You know, the kind of pragmat pragmatism that, that emerged. That's a huge step. How did that come about? Well, clearly with endless maneuvering within that group, and it was a hugely uncertain thing. This is not like Deng Xiaoping stood up and everybody applauded, oh, that's a great idea, we're going to do it. It was a lot of struggle, you know. Um, I think both of us are old but, enough. But I mean, the key, the key thing there, I mean, didn't they, yeah. they made sure that the, the, the cadres, right, participated in the economic yes, growth, yeah. right? So they basically said, all right, you know, everyone in the party is going to get rich yes. as, as a result of this, right? That they're going to, essentially become equity participant. I mean, first of all, the government is going to be an equity participant in this. And and the, the party members themselves are going to be equity participants in this, this growth, right? So they were able to set it up in, in that way that it was a win-win. Yeah, and I, and, and I like like the way you, you describe it. And I don't think in all countries it's so, it's necessarily like that as, part, I mean, as participatory. Of course, it's only seven uh, percent of the population that are members and so on in the party so it's still selective but it, but but you're right it's set up in a in a clever way so that that actually it creates a stability the deal is stable you know and that's an important part within your own polity it had to be stable so think of it in bangladesh where the constraints on the deal were largely you know horizontal different elite families and the whole kind of place it's not about an ordinary people that's not quite at the time that was playing, but it was very much, I think, the elite families that actually, you know, they had won independence, you know, it's about 10, 15 years after independence, uh, separating from, 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 from West Pakistan, but actually haven't delivered anything. And they probably got a bit worried whether they actually could survive themselves. So there's a bit like, we are not going to fight each other anymore, as they were doing, but actually we better have an implicit coalition to actually let certain things happen. So ideology was more dumped, pragmatic, new elites that emerged out, like in garments, we're not going to try to kill them off or whatever. And, and the same with Brax. So there it's very implicit and it's definitely in their interest coming out of a crisis and thinking, you know, we may not survive here. Ethiopia is then arguably, and maybe we, we, we maybe also it helped, the, the nature of the Ethiopian deal is interesting in the sense that it helps to explain maybe why it was much more fragile and seemed to have unraveled, is that, you know, we're talking about a small group of people. At the end, in the end was a controlled thing, people that were still representing those who had risen up in power through those, you know, this coalition led by Tigrayans that had gained power through to, 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 to violence and but they actually needed legitimacy. The, the prime minister at the time was very striking. He clearly, and in his writings, it's very clear, he, he sought legitimacy through development, probably conscious that the underlying political deal was quite fragile. So you seek legitimacy through development and saying, mm -hmm. that will help me to stay in power because there's no pressures then. And, but the political deal between, in, in Ethiopia between the different nationalities, the different ethnic groups, was quite fragile. And that's the one that's on, that actually came unstuck because actually... Mm -hmm. In any rent sharing deals, it's not just the ordinary people have to benefit, but actually those in power as well. And actually, mm -hmm. arguably, you could say in Ethiopia, it was very much some of these groups really perceived and then mobilized their own nationalities because they were not really part of the deal. And, and you know, because we should not forget the conflict in Ethiopia, all these people were in the deal to start with. This is not like uprising against something this is actually all all the people that had the elite deal that then broke down and i think you start looking at it in different ways in ghana it was actually they needed democracy to actually help to create some stability and a democracy of a kind where they learn to respect transitions of power which they hadn't done in the past so in, in, you have a huge 
culture there now of presidents that, that get kicked out and then quietly leave, very unlike most African countries. That's the basis of their stability. There's an elite deal and saying, yeah, for a while it's my time to eat. It's not not, not, it's a bit corrupt there. It's my time to eat and control government and keep on doing relatively sensible economic policies. And then, you know, well, if I kicked out, well, it's someone else's time to eat. And and, and it's a bit more the recognition of that. So it, it, it's very specific. Now, you asked about predictions. Um, you know, of course, history will still matter. The strength of the institutions. If I, if I can have a small elite can be really rich from oil, like in Nigeria, that's still going to be tricky because why the hell would I move aside? You know, why the hell? It's, mm -hmm. it's the deal works for, and it's not for five people, not for a hundred people. It's probably for 50 to hundred to a hundred thousand people. You know, Nigerian middle class, the top end, good life. They all have a house in London or somewhere, you know, and it works because there's enough oil to have a really good life for a hundred thousand people or maybe something like that. Um, and, you know, that's hard to undo. The other thing is also, you know, if you have a tradition of people will really expect a bit of results from government, then it becomes harder to, uh, but it's easier to, to actually sustain it. And I think Ghana is a case in point where actually this kind of bit more results, bit politics is there. But then in the end, how do I judge there is a development bargain emerging? I'll have to look at actions and behavior. So, so in my mind these days, what I have in mind is that in every country, if you talk to, to groups of people, and I've been doing this with Malawians a bit, if you were to make a list of 10 things that is really in the interesting power that doesn't change, but it's part of the, a symptom or maybe a cause of where everything is not going well, what would these 10 be? And we probably quickly agree on five of them. Then I would say, look, a government that begins to attack one of these five, I kind of think they're actually trying to really change it because they are doing it to move away from this kind of low level equilibrium to say, no, we need to take a bit of a gamble to go for another type of equilibrium here. And that means undoing some of the vested interests that want the status quo. Well, you know, in the, in the book, you talk about market failures and you talk about political failures or rather in, you know, government failures. But I think really the, the heart of the book is about political market failures, right? I mean, yeah. because it, it's it's one thing to say, oh, well, you know, the elites just need to cut a deal with everybody else. But, you know, who are the elites, right? I mean, do they have a, a, a do they have any kind of decision maker who can kind of act on their behalf? And And so, you know, I've always thought that when we look at a case like England, um, it's kind of an easy case because we already had, we, you know, they had parliaments and they had guilds and they had courts and they had all of these folks that could get together in a venue and, and kind of engage in horse trading. And these countries, you know, often don't have kind of stable representation of different interest groups, right? So, so do we need to spend more time thinking about, you know, kind of institutional design around you know, how to structure these bargains to facilitate them, to kind of make it more likely that the parties can actually get together. And uh, at least in, from an outside perspective, it seems like, you know, we're too fixated on kind of dragging and dropping like a, you know, U.S. style or U.K. style parliamentary system and then just having like a first past the post, you know, vote. And if it's the Kikuyu that win and they get to eat, and if it's the Kalenjin that win, they get to eat. That doesn't seem like a, you know an, an optimal way to design a uh, mechanism for horse trading. And and so you you talk a bit about governance and how you know you really need to kind of get the governance right. So so what would your advice be to uh, you know political players in these in these countries with respect to designing these systems? And and how would you know how would you convince them? Like if you're if you're if you're a Museveni and you have you know pretty good centralized control, like why would you ever want to kind of kind of give it up uh, and and have a more kind of decentralized um, you know governance regime? So yeah, so um, there's a lot in there, and, and and a lot that I agree with is that you know the simple importing of a of a political structure or a way of doing a particular politics it you know it just doesn't quite work and we you know the something that frustrates me a lot working in government is that you know i've seen sometimes from the more political 
political observers in inside government. I mean, observing of the politics of other countries. The only thing they were, the only time they were ever awake about Africa was, oh, there's an election. That's the moment. That's that's the key moment. And of course, these elections are actually in many places not that important. In in Malawi, I'm afraid they're not that important. You know, it's it's that underlying deal making that's much more important. So, so yeah, we want to be careful. Just having elections or not is not quite the way necessarily to guarantee uh, any progress. So, so the way I would think about it, and look. Forgive me, I'm an economist, and we have very simple minds sometimes about certain things. So it's a bit like, you know, you you uh, you, you you need to you need to think very carefully, either on improving the upside of of actually a deal that is a bit better, and so basically making it worthwhile for for a seven in the world of the world, which I, you know I write a bit about in the book. I thought. You know, he's a clever player. It's not. It, th th there are moments that you thought there was a bit of a development bargain there. You know, it's very growth on the end. It did pretty well in poverty reduction and so on. It's just that he just loves to be the one in charge all the time alone. And 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 so Uganda has actually quite a bit of a future. But and um, but you can just kind of think. You know, what can I do in terms of increasing the upside? And I don't mean it just as the leader where you pay them off or whatever. But um, um, you, you you can make it just by the way we um trade with them for example you know if you if you if you really um want to strengthen the bangladeshi kind of dynamic elite you know you you really want to throw your markets open and you even want to subsidize imports from these places you know because it's pretty hard to export at the best of times but actually, export is a long-run game. It's very hard to do. Just be very corrupt in exporting. You know, it's a hard stuff. It's extremely easy to be corrupt on importing. Um, and so you 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 create sound of incentives that they can take advantage. One thing that I'm these days quite quite taken by is a lot of these bad deals are actually stay in power because also uh, there is an awful lot of illicit finance. You know, the Nigerian elite deal is of course facilitated by endless places where money can be parked where dodgy deals can be done where where fake companies can be set up and so on so actually something we can really do is to make it actually much harder to keep these battle deals together by actually just making it so much harder that all these facilitators of uh, of illicit finance um you know at the moment do so you make it just much harder for these things and i think there's a bit of a window because you know, because, you know, of course, countries like the US and the UK believe in rule of law. So we are going to make laws now to do this for Russia. But of course, the laws will be there and we're going to make it tighter. You know, let's keep an eye on any of the other tin pot dictator, but also all kinds of elites that 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 plunder their own places and are not at all interested in development. So so there's things you can do and we need to be a bit more creative because just thinking a small project to build some capacity in the Malawian government, I don't think it will do it. You know, you you you, you need to you, you need to work a bit more more carefully on the on 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 the upside and on the downside the downside from the current deals and the upside of um, of potential better deals. Um, there's another thing that I said and I thought was really interesting on political markets, um, and um, you know that this is this is actually the the way often development bargains change and get a bit under pressure. Because, you know, once new groups, you know, we want some kind of openness that, that new groups can emerge, that that would be part of a dynamic growth-oriented society. They will want to have a stake in it. So there needs to be some space as well for them to be included. And so to doing it, because in many places, um, and I'm afraid that was the case in Ethiopia, it was definitely the case in Sudan historically, um, the best way to, to get, be, be more taken, be, to be taken seriously by the central state is by starting an armed uprising. <laughs> and so the political entrepreneur, the only route was to actually create more chaos. So you want to create enough opportunities that new elites can come in as well. And I think that's political markets, you know, to thinking about entry and exit the, the entry deterrence, can you do you reduce the barriers for new elites to emerge and so on? So there's a lot of these frameworks of industrial economics from that actually we yeah. should use for to thinking more about political markets. Yeah, I kinda like that. Like think think like an antitrust type person, right? You know, you wanna facilitate the good deals and break up the the, the bad deals, right? Yeah. And so 
Um, so one way to kind of strengthen the, the good deals would be to, uh, you know, look for those players that are, that, that lack representational capacity and maybe kind of encourage it in some way. And is this, is this kind of in line with when people talk about building civil society, right? I mean, is there an overlap between that discussion and this idea of, you know, giving these, these folks some organization, I mean, maybe fostering trade associations, fostering, um, uh, you, you know, uh, chambers of commerce or, or, you know, fostering these, these, these non, maybe non-political forms of representation so that they can get a seat at the table. Yeah. So, so, so yes, so that's correct, but you need to be really careful and selective on. So you mentioned chamber of commerce in many places. These are the, these are the usually very close to government. These are the connected businesses mm -hmm. and so on. So they're not necessarily the ones. But 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 the point, the underlying point, is really really good. And 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 just a couple of examples that recently I I came now across is that so so one thing I got very frustrated in Nigeria. And you know I, I people like me get very frustrated with Nigeria in general. Uh, there we've poured a lot of money, also from outside, but even in, in internal philanthropists, um, money in civil society, but. You know, the, the point with civil society is that actually, if you then go and agitate, there has to be someone who cares enough that actually agitation has an impact on them. And so, for example, they were looking at the transparency that of, of the way the elections were controlled in, in Nigeria and the, the change of money and exposing all kinds of things. But fundamentally, the elite doesn't care about it at all. So there's, these programs has virtually no impact. So, so, it's, so it's just building up. It's a bit like supply and demand, you know, building up the supply side without there's actually a demand for any of that. It's not going to help you that much. So you, you need to think a bit like what is the entry point, say, in Nigeria? But interestingly, a few days ago, we were talking with a group of people around, you know, what would be an elite bargain look like in, in South Africa, where they clearly need a new growth model and it's quite stuck and worrying in all kinds of ways. And and someone, uh, look, I can, can mention it on, on, on a podcast like this, it's like Ricardo Hausmann, of course, is a smart guy, and he's been working, thinking about growth stuff in that country. And, and he made the observation that, you know, the, 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 the interests of mining have far more influence than the interest of agriculture. Mm -hmm. And I mean that broader agriculture, not just the, the, the few Afrikaner farmers or whatever, but broader agriculture. And of course, because the mining interest is just a few players, they can organize themselves well, they can do it. Yeah. And so their case is always heard. So there's nothing that will ever happen. While, and someone like Ricardo would say, and I probably would agree with it, there's a lot of growth potential and export potential still from South African agriculture. They are incredibly good in they're supplying already lots in Europe, but they could do far more. And of course, it's very labor intensive. There's also more black farmers involved in that and so on. But they're just not organized. And so actually, mm -hmm. you know, it made me think, you know, clearly there's actually a good idea here to actually say, well, how do you bring a trade organization, not just as a lobby group, yeah. but actually as a as a force for 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 shifting this kind of relative importance in politics? And 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 I think that's exactly also what you allude to, I think. And that I think that's absolutely right. But you need to get a good sense of the underlying political economy networks, you know, who would be the players. And this is a bit like I find interesting, just a final quick thing, is that when I talk to political scientists, they then just say who are the ones that could make noise and politically are important. If I talk to economists, then it's like, oh, you look at the GDP thing. It's the two together. You know, you need to kind of mm -hmm. have a thing that because we end up sometimes supporting these groups where there's no chance in hell that they ever will contribute to growth in that economy and actually change anything. <laughs> and that, no, that's not helpful either. You need to find the groups that at the same time can also be helping the transformation of these economies and make them grow, make them dynamic, make them inclusive, and so on. So you need the two sides and thinking, thinking about your point in two ways, from the economic and from the political side. Well, I mean, with agriculture, I mean, you can have a solution like we have in the U.S. where, you know, the agricultural interests are overrepresented in the Senate, right? You know, so you have, it's a, it's a dispersed group, but, you know, we, you know, try to counter that with, uh, with, with overrepresentation. I think Japan, you know, does the same thing and many of the European countries do, do the same thing and maybe create something of a, of, of a balance. Yep. Um, but I, I guess, um, another, another question I have for you, if we look at some of the really, really bad cases, right? You know, we look at, 
say, Congo. We look at Afghanistan. I mean, you couldn't imagine a better situation than to put somebody who wrote a book on failed states in charge, right? And that's what we, you know, that's what happened in Afghanistan. And so, you know, I, I think it's a bit ironic that that we had someone who is like an expert. I mean, if you, Stefan, you know, we put you in charge of the Congo, right? You know, would we expect any kind of of, of success? And 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 then I guess the the second question is, you know, we we know about um, the resource curse, right? And when you have and I think the resource course is, is under, misunderstood by most people. Most people think, oh, if you've got a lot of resources, then, you know, you're not going to have any need to pay attention. It's not really about, you know, the presence of resources. It's about the presence of resources that can, um, that, that can you know, be controlled re- relatively simply, right, with, with it, you know, and the knowledge and the know-how is relatively easy, easy to acquire in one place, right? So oil is a perfect example. You know, mining is an example. Um, you know, foreign aid serves as, has more or less the same function as, as the resource curse, right? Where if you look at Afghanistan, the vast, you know, half a majority of their budget came from foreign aid. So they spend most of their time trying to satisfy their external constituents in, instead of their internal constituents. So, so I'm, I'm somebody who studied the history of taxation. And so, you know, my view is that when the government needs your money, then they will, you know, pay attention to you. And if, if they don't need your money, they're, they're not going to pay attention to you. Should, should we be thinking about, you know, designing optimal tax policy in, in a way that would encourage more, more development? Is, is, that, is that a technological silver bullet in some way? So, so look, there, there, there are many people uh, – that would agree with with that as the kind of primary thing we should be doing. Yeah? So people like uh, Tim Besley or Torsten Persson, they 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 written books, a book and articles about it, and kind of say, look, that's the first thing you, you. It's a bit like the first thing you start with it. And so 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 the tricky thing with 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 that silver bullet is that, um, and and. It's it's always a bit like what you does it mean in terms of how you will then start with that, because you said it very carefully. Is that and that definitely happened in England historically. The state needed your money, okay. So that's not the same as saying helping a state to get money. And uh, and so some of the most effective, actually also research projects on 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 um, on, on working on governance and government have been all these programs, including in the DRC in Congo, uh, in trying to, um, you know, they and, and, and they're, they're published with this kind of real air around it. Look, we found something where we can get the government to work because they now become very effective in raising taxes. Mm-hmm. Now, I kind of smile at it because it's the last thing I want to do in the, uh, in the regime at the time. Kabila's regime put more money in their pockets. And so you could have the same kind of thing. So, so you, you, you expressed it well. And, and what is much harder to get to a situation, and that's not an optimal taxation design, but actually a situation where the state needs you mm-hmm. and that somehow it needs money from you or something. And of course, then if we come back with the National Natural Resource Curse, it doesn't need money from you. With, mm-hmm. If we overdo aid, it doesn't need money from you. But the problem is if we then send in endless IMF experts how to raise uh, taxes, uh, without actually thinking about what they'll do with it, well, um, it won't have any impact either. And so it's that it's it's when taxation becomes a part of the accountability that it's there. But the but but if you look around, and I think sometimes so. Sorry, so what you're saying that so you're saying that even if even if you know Kabila, you know, he needed your money in order to build his you know house in in, in Provence, right? I mean. Yeah. Shouldn't that be enough? Like, if, if the only way I can build my house in Provence is to, you know, provide you with public goods that enable you to build businesses, like, shouldn't that be enough, right? That, does it matter that, that, that he's going to spend his money on the house in Provence or, or spend it on, you know, other stuff if, if but, but, the only but, way but he can since, get it is to... Yeah, but since he controls the state, um, and, and of course it happened with Mobutu, with this, with this uh, well, before the two Kabilas came... Um, so Mobutu um, clearly believed in that principle. You know, let's let's make sure 
we raise all the money because I do want my house in, 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 in the Provence. I want a few houses in the Provence and I want lots more. Um, but in some sense, you know, and, and, and a kleptocracy is a way like, you know, I just, the only thing I focus on is on raising the money. And I don't care how I did it. So Mobutu initially was doing it with taxation and then he was taxing all the uh, the expat business that had all disappeared and he was just taking them on. Then he started looking for his own people and he kept on just plundering and plundering. And of course, if you, and, and because you control the state, you have the monopoly of, of, of violence. Well, he didn't have to do that much. So, so this is a bit like where the sequence of saying what you said again, you know, only if I need to provide the public goods to be able to raise the taxes, this this fiscal contract can work. Mm. And and the fiscal contract historically got to work in the in the in the cities in Europe where where we first noticed these fiscal contracts and so on. And I'm sure historically in other parts of the world as well. But we can't take it for granted. And it's always a little bit like what you do in policy and say, oh, clearly taxation design is the optimal thing to do. Oh, we sent in the IMF, go and raise the taxes. I said, no, it doesn't, doesn't mean anything will be done with it. It's it, it, it so on. And so, so, it, so that other part of trust in the state has to be there as well. That kind of that, that mutual dependence has to be there. And I, I, I don't think I can take it for granted. And, and can I actually comment? There was a but weren't, weren't the kind of, weren't the... Oh, Weren't weren't the wars the like the English wars and the French wars? I mean, weren't they just sort of like houses in Provence, right? I mean, you know, Louis the Fourteenth wants to, you know, he wants to go after the Spaniards so he can install his nephew or whatever. I mean, isn't that how is that different from you know building building a house in Provence, no, but <laughs> like having a bank part, account in Bermuda? Well, if you go to the English parliamentary records and look, I'm not an expert on it. I'm just occasionally you, you hear these things, you know. There would be endless debates in Parliament in terms of, you know, what do we get in return? You know, yes, they needed money for wars, but they had to actually they, the the contract with the with the landed classes was on all kinds of certain things, and so many things that had happened in in the changes in agricultural structures, the the changes, and 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 you know, they they had to start the, the pressure to provide something in return was there, and that's what I kind of emphasise because of course. With Parliament being strong in the historically in the British case and the kings being weak, they had to allow then certain things to be happening with that money that benefited the estates of these people. And I think that's what I'm alluding to is that if you are you you can't take it for granted that actually public goods will be created. Of course, maybe we learned that actually Mobutu style plundering would probably not allow your regime to continue for very long because the regime ends because there's no more money left, and so maybe there is something there. But um, but I am I am I, I will say I, I am concerned that that we make it too easy to that it's on the taxation side. And me, the, the only thing I basically say an optimal taxation policy and design should have a form of what I do with the money as well, and it's that accountability, not necessarily through a political control, but the actual facts, what you do. And I think that's interesting if you, if I go back to say Ghana, and we saw that actually in the recent election in Kenya, where people begin to actually, you know, vote based on some results now, that they actually move away from purely ethnic base because after a bit, that story is not credible anymore either, that it, that, that, that I'll look after the, your ethnic group. And then you had to basically the case of the, the, the constituencies around Mount Kenya, that everybody including Kenyatta thought would be voting for the one guy and the vast majority now voted for the other one which is clearly because they actually hadn't seen anything they were taken for granted that they could be be taxed without actually getting in anything in return now you have this wonderful um analogy right where you talk about the hippo's ears and, and I guess this is you probably didn't create this but I'd never heard it before um and I, you know I think the the message is that a, a lot of what happens uh, uh, happens beyond the immediate visibility of the folks who kind of parachute in and, and take a look around. So to what extent do development economists really need to kind of do a deeper dive into the kind of de facto workings of, of the economy and of the political system, right? I mean, it's it's easy enough. I mean, you I don't know how you do it because you, you, you visited probably 50 countries, I mean, just that you mentioned in the book, you know, how can you go in there and kind of size up what, what's happening? I mean, isn't it 
require a lifetime of immersion in these countries to really understand the the, the rest of the hippo? Yes. So 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 on that on that last point, definitely, um, you know. Thank God for lots of very good scholars and uh, and a lot of people you end up being able to talk to and they can recommend you the reading and so on to do it. And of course, I was I was doing this a lot in a, quite a privileged position, you know, like I'm a senior person in in DFIT. Um and and uh, so you've got a lot of people debating, discussing, and helping with the essence. But but yeah, so you you but but you but I think. I, and I don't design, it's a bit like, you know, it's like why you don't put me in charge of one of these countries, because, you know, what I would, the first thing I would do is actually getting a group of people that actually really knows the, the, the place. It's a bit like Ashraf Ghani, you know, you mentioned him and, you know, in his book, he wrote, he basically, I think in the first hundred days, I think he counted something like 140 things you needed to do in the first hundred days. That clearly showed to me he had never worked in a place like that. Uh, and of course, he had been working in, in the US all, the, all this professional career. And that's the kind of thing. So you need people that know how the place would work and, and to do it. But what you also say on, on what economists and political scientists need to do is to, is to actually yeah, be, be, be very careful not to assume too much about how a place functions. Okay, so 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 dig into it and be challenged and be be questioned about it. And and there is there is a bit of work, you know. There's there's good scholars in political science and in, in economics that actually do it. Maybe what you then end up seeing published needs to be able to be read by an editor of a journal who sits in Chicago and never left the university. So you end up what they write is probably not commensurate to the insight that they've gained, which is a very sad state of affairs of academia because we write it to, for the for the bloke or for the woman who's never really left their ivory tower, uh, who controlled the profession. So, so that's 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 a problem in the profession. But, but I still think there are you know there are development economists that spend much more time on the ground. I know political scientists are not much less about the theory about it, much more doing the empirical work. So, so these are the ones that begin to. To, to, to help us uncover. And of course, locally, you know, there's, there are, you know, because partly, as you said, these countries are getting better off and so on, you know, we also have very good scholars there now and we need to give them a voice and, and, and let them and help them to articulate that the, these realities. So we need to dig deeper, yeah. And um, the hippo, yeah, most of it is underwater. So we need to be willing to go into the murky waters to, to, uh, to discover a bit more about it. Now, as a practitioner with DFID, I mean, you, you described this, this wonderful scene that I mentioned at the beginning where you met with the minister uh, and, you know, <laughs> she said, OK, what do I do? And he said, well, here, here are, you know, 15 books for, for you to read. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, you, you need to provide some advice and, and kind of explain what, you know, what do you need to do? And, you know, to get back to that kind of venture capital analogy, um, I always think of the venture capitalist. Their main job is to help the founder prioritize, right? Just figure out, okay, I've got 500 things to do. You know, what's what's top of the list? So if you were advising someone in the UK government who is going to provide some kind of aid to one, one of these, these developing countries, and that when they provide the aid, that's when they have the opportunity to kind of help shape the priorities to some small degree of the recipient of that aid, you know, what would be the, what would be the advice that would be embedded with that, with that aid, right? What would be the kind of conditionality that would be embedded with that aid? What would be the top priority that you would want? And I know it's going to differ from country to country, but, but how would you kind of go through that process of figuring out how to make the biggest impact with the, the smallest amount of aid? Yeah. So, um, so, so the first thing you, you will, and the, and the, the analogy of the venture capitalist come back, comes back in, is that, you know, you need to be willing to be selective. And that includes the places where you want to invest. You know, you, you, can't, you can't go quickly at scale in certain places. You may need to do smaller things. Now, that actually is quite hard, as seen from London or from, from Washington, where, where often the politicians want to make the priorities and actually want to carve it up, as seen from London or as seen from Congress in uh, Capitol Hill. So you want to actually be 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 willing to say, well, we'll need to be more selective where we're actually going to spend it, but then we'll need to be willing to um, adapt it and and be 
much more agile locally with your team of how you actually adjust it. And what I also would do, and so it's a, it, it goes against the models that we use, where the priorities are set in, you know, in London or in or in or in DC. And it's and it, I'm really struck that 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 say, oh, this is the priorities we are doing health or we're doing food. You know, we've decided it's food. Now, for the kind of change I want, it's not there's not at all clear that working on food security is for every country in the world the best entry point to actually get change. For the reason that we had, you know, in certain places, there may be certain groups where there's actually an opportunity to work with. And, you know, if they make plastic buckets, I would work with the plastic bucket producers rather than with mm -hmm. food producers. I would want to do this. So, so you need to decentralize. You need to be willing to do it. Now, from the moment you decentralize, you have to do, and that's the hardest one, you know, you, you need to be willing, which is as outsiders we don't really like to do, is to, you know, place your bets, and then it's a bit like the venture capitals, trust your team, you know, the, trust these teams that, that they're actually going to do it. You know, you give, give them advice, but trust somehow that team that, that actually will do it. That means, you know, you make a, make a bet on Ghana and, and the Ghanaians that are in power rather than trying to say, no, no, actually your priorities are wrong. I'm going to do my own because then you do everything. It's nothing there. So that's a little bit the tricky bit you need to be doing. And in, in the development aid, we don't like to do it. You use the word conditionality and say, well, conditionality will not work because the guys that don't want to develop will not develop because you put some conditions on your aid. They will find a way around it. And the people who want to develop, why do you put them the, the conditions on it? You know, help them to do it in their way. And yeah, and make sure that they learn. And you could put your money in evaluations and say, look, as long as you promise we evaluate well what you now did and then willing to actually embrace some of the lessons, it's fine. But rather than, no, no I'm going to tell you that you're going to prioritize in your country food security or health system strengthening. And in your place, we don't and, and we won't do that because that's not what we do. No, you, you need to be willing, you know, if in the end it's these elites that somehow have the power to block everything, well, you need to work with them. And that means the governments, the big, big, the big players, rather than saying, oh, I'm going to be the, the cleaner than clean little outsider there working with some obscure um, NGO with the British or American flag on. And wow, will I feel good that I'm changing this country? No, you're not changing this country. You're doing trivial things. You may do good. But I don't think the sums involved from foreign aid from governments are just there to do little bits of good to do it. You know, this is an opportunity we miss because if we only do that, we'll screw it up further. As we saw in Afghanistan and so on, where the volumes involved, there's no way you could ever build up a state. You know, whether Ghana was the right person and all the other problems, well, there's just no way you'll ever build up uh, an accountable state by, 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 by acting like that. By the way, oh, Stephen, thank you. it's not very popular to tell my boss, you know, it basically say, <laughs> give your power away. It has to be more locally. Trust the other government. Of course, that's why I can sit in that room as an advisor, but maybe being less successful than I sometimes would like to be. <laughs> well, Stefan, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, the book here is called uh, Gambling on Development, um, Why Some Countries Win and Others Lose. Uh, and, you know, it's not really about gambling. <laughs> it's actually trying to uh, reduce the, convert the gambling into some, you know, strategic betting. Uh, I think that's really the idea. So, um, again, thanks for joining me. Hope to chat again sometime soon. Yes, well, thank you very much, Greg. It was a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.